If you'll open your Bibles today to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, I'll be reading verse 54 in the New King James Version. Matthew 27, 54. So when the centurion and who, those who were following or with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. May the Lord place a blessing on the reading of his word today. Roger makes out the schedule for we who are going to speak. And my schedule actually came two weeks ago. But as we sat in board meeting, and I will tell you this, the pastor chaired our board meeting for the first time. And he gave a wonderful devotion, and as I listened to his devotion, I said, that man can speak. And then it was brought up that the next week was going to be communion, and I suggested that the pastor have our communion. And he said, I don't know because I do get sick. And I said, well, here's what we'll do. You plan on it if you can, but I'll prepare a sermon. If things kind of go wrong, I'll jump up here and we'll have a little sermon. So I prepared a short communion-type sermon that I didn't have to give. And I told Roger, I said, now I have a sermon that I can give if I'm needed. And he said, well, we're going to put you down in two more weeks. So that's today. And I kind of, actually I was going to do another sermon. And yet the Lord kept impressing upon me that I should do what I had started. And so I kind of lengthened it a little bit to make it a sermon that we could give today. Let's bow our heads a moment, please. Gracious Heavenly Father, again we approach you. And Lord, we have but one request, and that is we would see Jesus. It's not about Will Feltman today or what I say. In fact, if you can take me out of the picture, but if today those here can see Jesus, that is our request, and that's our prayer this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you lived in Southern California in the 60s, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, on Sabbath afternoon, the place to be might be the cemetery. Well, it's not just any cemetery. It's a cemetery you've all heard the name of. It's called Forest Lawn. And you say, well, why would we go there? And I'm about to tell you. As you drive out on the edge of Glendale, you come to these hundreds and hundreds of acres that set aside to be probably the most famous cemetery in the world. And you drive through the big gates. You drive in and you pass the tombstones of what this world considers the rich and the famous. People like Marilyn Monroe and James Dean and all of those people of Hollywood, they're buried there. But that's not why we're here. And that's not why Adventists would come on Sabbath afternoon. If you drive along and you come to the first large building, which is a small auditorium, and you are to go in, you will see a picture. And on this picture, it's a picture of the Last Supper. All of the 12 disciples are there. Jesus is there. And for a half hour, this speaker plays and it tells you about each disciple. And there is John with his head on Jesus' breast. And there is Judas and all of the other disciples. But that is alone not the high point of why we go 
to Forest Lawn. After we see this program, we come back out and we begin climbing the hill. And as I thought about this, I, I wish that I could take all of you together, put you in a bus, and take you there, and let you see what I have seen many times. And because I cannot do that, the best I can do is share with you what's there. As you go to the top of the hill, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. You can overlook the city of Los Angeles on one side, the city of Glendale on another. There is a large Colosseum-type building. And as you enter it, you climb the stairs. You go in, and it's in a large amphitheater. It's dark, semi-dark. Music is playing, and in front there is a screen, curtains, with curtains across it, the size of your IMAX that you might see in Branson. And when the time comes, the curtains are drawn back, and there is the painting of the crucifixion. In the center of it is Jesus on the cross. To the right and left are the thieves, and surrounding it are all those who are gathered there that day. And for the next hour, you will see the spotlight move from figure to figure to figure, and it tells about that individual that's there at the foot of the cross. When I was thinking of something to do for communion, I thought how nice it would be if we could just talk about some of those that are there that day. You know, the spirit of prophecy tells us that we should spend an hour a day on Christ's life, especially the closing scenes. And I don't know about you, but I fall far short of that. In my busy day, I... I'm lucky if I get in that 15 minutes of reading, you know. But I'm endeavoring to do better. I'm trying. And if we are to start talking about those characters that are there, perhaps number one would be a man who never even intended to come. His name was Simon of Cyrene, and if you would like to follow along with me, I will give you a Bible text for each one. If you want to take notes, that's fine. If you want a Bible text, I'll give you a Bible text for each one that we're talking about. Most of it will be found, they'll all be found in the Gospels, right? It's interesting, as I was preparing for this, I saw the difference in the Gospels. Each Gospel writer thought about something that was important to them. But if you start with Matthew 27, Matthew spends the most time of any on the crucifixion. Matthew 27, 32 mentions Simon of Serene. Simon didn't live in Jerusalem. He was coming, he got up that morning intending to go to Jerusalem on business there's some interesting things about the man. Although he had seen Jesus, he had been interested in Jesus, he had never made a commitment to him, but he had two sons who had, and they were followers of Jesus. And that morning, as he is on his journey, he's headed toward the city on business all of a sudden, he's attracted to this crowd, this, this angry crowd, this mob. And so out of curiosity, as we all would do, he, he went over there. He walked over. And as he saw who it was, and some next to him said, well, you know, it's Jesus of Nazareth. They're going to crucify him. He was aghast. Why, he, he knew of nothing that Jesus had done, that anyone would want to crucify him. And... Surely he thought this must be the work of 
some of the priests and the rulers who were jealous. And so he worked his way closer, and as he got there, he was horrified at what he saw. And it was at this moment as Jesus, after a long night of fake trials, of, of it being scourged, beaten, persecuted, and the cross had been laid on his back, and it was at that moment that he fainted, he, he fell. And there he lay, what a pitiful sight, he lay there on the stones with the cross on his back. And Simon, he, he just couldn't contain himself. He just gasped out how terrible. How, and one of the Roman soldiers looking around wondering what to do, they certainly weren't going to carry the cross. They said, you, you, you're, 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 you're sorry for him? You, uh, you sympathize with him? Well, then why don't you carry the cross? And so he grabbed a couple of his comrades and said, here's a man that must be one of his followers although he really wasn't. And so they compelled Simon to carry the cross of Jesus. The Spirit of Prophecy has an interesting statement about Simon. Although that day he was compelled to carry the cross of Jesus, from that point on, he gladly carried the cross of Jesus for himself without being compelled to do so. He became a follower. He became a Christian. For undoubtedly that day he stayed at the crucifixion. The next people that are mentioned, Matthew 27, 55, if you're following, was a group of women These were not the women that were the closest to Jesus, like his mother or Mary Magdalene. We'll talk about them later. But these were just a group of women who had followed Jesus. Many of them had carried their sick to him to be healed. Maybe in that crowd was the woman who was healed after being sick all her life of an, of an issue of blood. And it says she reached out and touched his garments. Maybe she was one. But they had seen Jesus. They had seen the miracles that he had done. And they had listened to his teachings. Perhaps the Sermon on the Mount. Many of them had been there when he fed the 5,000. They'd been among that. And as they saw the way he was being treated after what he had done for them, they began weeping and crying. And Jesus, even in his weakened condition, looks at them and says, Women, don't weep for me but weep for yourselves and for the sins of Jerusalem. He was looking ahead in time just 30-some years further down the road when by rejecting God, Jerusalem would become destroyed. Remember the disciples had been so proud of the temple and pointed out those huge blocks that were there, and Jesus says, yes, but there will come a day when not one of those blocks is going to be left one upon another. And Jesus looked ahead at that time, and he said, just weep for yourselves. Another group can talk about this morning are the Roman soldiers. You can find mention of them in the book of John, the 19th chapter, 23 and 24. To them it was just another crucifixion. 
designed by the Romans to get the most amount of suffering out of the victims that they could. Yet that day there were two groups of Roman soldiers. One class had heard of Jesus and didn't understand the Jewish leader's hatred of him. As they witnessed his actions and heard his words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, they were convicted that he was indeed who he claimed to be. Some became converts. But other soldiers, witnessing the same scene, had so hardened their hearts, they no longer responded to the Holy Spirit. And in a fulfillment of the prophecy written by David in Psalms 22, 18, where David wrote, They divided my garments among them, for my clothing they cast lots. And two of the soldiers did exactly as David said they would do. So they looked at that long robe. They were about to cut it in two, and they said, No, no, it's worth more as one. Let's roll the dice. Let's see what happens. One will take all, and one will take nothing. Men of that time were prone to do. It was fun. It was gambling. And so they gambled and won one and one lost. As we look at Jesus hanging on that cross, we see next to him two men. The thief on the left, Luke mentions him in the 23rd chapter of Luke, verse 29, as there were two classes of soldiers there that day, there were two thieves. The one on the left continued mocking Jesus until he died. He had the same opportunity as the thief on the right, but he chose not to take advantage of it. The thief on the right, he's mentioned also, Luke 23, verse 40 to 43, if you're following along in the Bible. In the desire of ages, Ellen White tells us that this man was not a hardened criminal. He'd fallen into bad company, and he'd allowed others to lead him into a life of crime He'd seen and heard Jesus, and he was convicted of his teachings. But this is shocking. He was turned away from Jesus by the priests and the rulers who had condemned him as being a fake and a phony. And so the man did not follow his conscience and follow Jesus. But as his companion, the thief on the left, continued to mock Jesus, a conviction comes to him and he says, Don't you fear God? You see, he had nothing more to fear from man. Man had done everything he could do. He was dying. The method of crucifixion was so designed so that they would ordinarily have been on that cross for three or four days. Some are told as long as a week before they literally starved to death. And the crucifixion took their life. But that was not to be today because today was Friday and the Jews, as the Romans knew, would not tolerate people hanging on the cross on their holy Sabbath. So, it was the custom then to break the legs so that they could not push themselves up and they would suffocate to death within a matter of an hour or less. So maybe they were the lucky ones to be crucified on a Friday. But this thief, 
turned to his companion and he said, Do you not fear God? I know you don't fear man. We have nothing more to fear. They've done everything they can, but the next person you're going to meet is God. And then he cries out in desperation as he looks to Jesus. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Again, the spirit of prophecy tells us something very interesting about this. That amid all of his suffering, that one cry for help was a glimmer of light to Christ. He saw in the, re in the belief and in the request of that thief the reason he was dying a representative of all that he had come to save. And immediately, without thinking, he says, I say unto you today, I'm telling you now, you're going to be with me in paradise. You know, that day, he's the only one there that had spoken that way to Christ. Even his, the priests and the rulers, they, they used the words, you know, if you're the son of God, come down. You know, you've saved others, yourself, you, you don't seem to be able to save. And even his disciples were doubting. The words were, we trusted that it had been him who would have delivered Israel. But here this thief recognizes him as Lord. His mother. John, we find this in John, the 19th chapter, 26 and 27. Is it any wonder that this incident is found only in the book of John. Of everything that happened that day, this must have had very special significance to John. Of all those who were witnessing his crucifixion, surely Mary suffered most of all. You know, when I think about Mary, I can't help remembering the words of that song that's written by Mark Lowry. Mary, did you know? Mary, when you kissed your baby child, did you know you kissed the face of God? This child you're holding has walked where angels trod. You know, those are beautiful words, aren't they? For 30 years, Jesus had been a faithful son to Mary. Sometime during that 30 years, her husband, who I believe was much older, Joseph, had passed away. and She must have depended much more on Jesus. She alone knew who his real father was. And like many others, she must have had hopes that he would indeed be the Messiah and that he would save Israel. And we can only imagine Mary's grief at seeing him so cruelly treated. And if we're sitting again in that auditorium and we see that spotlight and it moves, it moves again to another character, it moves to John. John the Beloved who wanted to be the closest to Jesus. He's the one that had been comforting Mary. John, the beloved, he wrote the book of John, and then 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And finally, on the island of Patmos, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Standing by Mary, doing his best to console her, and as Jesus looks down on him, 
he bestows to him the greatest gift that he is able. He says, speaking first to his mother, Mary, behold your son. And then to John, he says, John, behold your mother. In the coming years, this must have been quite a consolation to John. Not a responsibility. It was a responsibility, but not a burden to him. He found that, I believe, to be a blessing. That he was the one designated to take care of the mother of Jesus. Number eight, if you're counting... The spotlight moves again to a woman kneeling at the cross. Mary Magdalene. Matthew 27, 56, she's mentioned. And also in Mark 14, 9, something is said about her. In Mark, he says, her story would be told wherever the gospel is told. Mary, the woman many believe who was caught in adultery and rescued by Jesus, forgiven of her sins, Mary, who anointed Jesus' feet with precious oil, were told the value of it would have equaled a year's wages. And when she was reproved, Jesus said, leave her alone. She has anointed me for burial. And don't worry about the poor. You'll have them with you forever. You can always take care of the poor if you have a desire to. And I believe that Mary represents each one of us here today, for all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But by repentance of sin and faith in Jesus, we'll have victory over that sin and have a right to spend eternity with Jesus. In Joe's class, and I tell you, we have really enjoyed that. We go to Joe's Sabbath school class. We're having an understanding there of righteousness by faith. Now, I don't think that Mary ever heard it put quite that way. She may not have heard those words but I certainly believe she understood the concept. Number nine. Roger read this text. Matthew 27, 54. (laughs) Our Roman centurion. You know, the day... Must have just started out for him like every other. He'd been in, he was in charge of 100 Roman soldiers. His duty in Jerusalem was to keep the peace, to put down rebellions, of which there had been a few. And uh, it seems there was always an insurrection in the making, and on this day he was assigned to one of his least liked assignments the crucifixion duty. But that day, he didn't mind it quite so much because he was assigned to crucify public enemy number one, Barabbas. Barabbas had been a real thorn in his side, a murderer, a thief, the head of a gang, if you will, And it was going to be good to be rid of him, finally. And then it seemed like something something was changing. Instead of crucifying public enemy number one, the crowd and the mob, really led by the priests and the rulers, had come before Pilate and they demanded Jesus be crucified. That didn't make any sense to him. Why, he knew about Jesus. In fact, he'd, he kind of admired him. He'd, he'd watched him 
uh, he'd come on his radar because there had been accusations that he was come to overthrow the Roman government. And so he made sure he kept an eye on the man. And, well, all he could see was that he was doing good. He saw him heal people. He listened carefully to his preaching, and it, it didn't seem anything like rebellion. And uh, he had written him off as a threat. He, he, he just he didn't believe that he was. In fact, he really admired the good that he was doing. And as the day progressed, and the crucifixion took place, he witnessed Jesus asking God to forgive even him because he knew not what he said forgive them Lord for they know not what they do and that included him well he'd witnessed quite a few crucifixions for sure and he'd seen a number of men die but this was different and then then the darkness came darkness like he'd never seen he couldn't see his hand in front of his face and then the earthquake and then the lightning and he couldn't help himself as he the holy spirit touched his heart and the words just poured out surely surely this was the son of god there's one more group the last group the priests and the rulers at first rejoicing in their victory. No longer would they have to contend with Jesus. Why, twice the man had thrown him out of their own temple. And many times they tried to ensnare him with conversation. And he managed to turn the tables and they ended up kind of looking foolish. And every time it happened they hated him hated him worse. But they'd finally gotten the victory. There he was on the cross. There had been one small thing that kind of rubbed him the wrong way. Why, Pilate had written above there the king of the Jews, and they saw the mistake right away, and they went back to Pilate, and they said, Now, Pilate, that's not the way it really should read. Um, it should read... He says he's the king of the Jews, or he claims to be king of the Jews, and Pilate says, don't bug me. What I've written, I've written. Pilate, angry at being manipulated, says, what I have written, I have written. So there it stood. But the spirit of prophecy tells us they were deeply troubled, troubled, even though they had spent the day mocking him, he'd not responded to them in any way. And then the darkness came and fell upon the cross, and the earth began to shake, and they were filled with fear. Desire of Ages says they ran back to the city, beating their breasts in absolute terror. Doesn't sound like much of a victory, does it? And somehow, this statement struck me. Somehow, they feared a dead Jesus more than a live one. As we've taken a look at the events on Calvary some 2,000 years ago, we must not forget that Jesus went through it all and died that each one of us here can have eternal life. Life with him in heaven for eternity. For this we shall be forever thankful. And as we contemplate the scene that took place, we're forced to ask ourselves the same question that those that were there that day had to ask themselves, who is this Jesus? And when we do, I hope that each one of us here comes to that same conclusion that the Roman centurion came to. Surely, this is the Son of God. 
As we close with hymn number 163, I would ask that you meditate on the words of this song, At the Cross, At the Cross. All right, number 163, At the Cross. Please stand with me. Father, we are so grateful that you sent your Son to this earth to live for us and to show us how to live, and then to die for us that we might have eternal life. But beyond that, Lord, we know that you and he are coming back for us to take us home again someday. We pray that that will be soon, Lord, and that each one here will be ready to go when that great day comes. We ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.